Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, Bethany, I don't know why I'm having trouble with that word, Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with a ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And he had a bad case of something. And this was not just a little stomach ache or a fever, or a headache. It may have included those things, but it was deeper than that. When Jesus heard that, that he said, this sickness is not unto death, he told the brethren, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Holy Father God, enlighten our hearts and our minds, our souls and spirits. Ladies and gentlemen, we are quoting Tim Keller, again, the venerable pastor of New York City. Uh, rarely do we quote somebody back to back, but he said here, Christianity teaches that contrary to fatalism, suffering is overwhelming. Contrary to Buddhism, suffering is real. Contrary to karma, Danita, Suffering is often unfair. But contrary to secularism, suffering is meaningful. There is a purpose to it. And if faced in the right way, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability. Yes, suffering has a stabilizing effect on on people, there's no doubt about it. And he goes on to say, and spiritual power than you can imagine. Oh, Brother Tim must have gone through some things in life for him to write something like that. Dear friends, when we have a desperate situation on our hands, we want people to jump very quickly at our beck and call when like the other lady the other day had a situation uh, and whenever we hear the people calling 911 after the fact you never hear anybody say to the ambulance uh, to the people on the other end, uh, when you get a chance, can you come by? Because somebody's breaking into my house. I know y'all are busy and got other people you got to take care of, but uh, if you get a chance, uh, stop by here at 826 Chauncey Street. Uh, the joke is almost in my house, so I can see his head. Uh, yes, ma'am, we'll send somebody over. Okay, thank you very much. They don't do that. No, <laughs> they want. <laughs> they want those folks, whoever they are, to move. They want them there. They want to hear some sirens right now. Yes, 
we want the ambulance here 10 minutes ago. We want the prescription filled yesterday because this pain in my gut has slapped me down to the ground. I can't do anything. I can't even think straight, much less try to work, much less try to take care of my family. I got a pain in my stomach right now in my gut. I don't know where it's coming from, liver, uh, intestines. I don't have time for no tests. I don't have time for nobody trying to comfort me. I don't want to hear nothing. I might rise up and slap you if you try to talk to me. And come. I need some pills that will kill this pain. We want the doctor to see us immediately. We don't want to hear nothing about an appointment. I got to be seen today. And uh, since the advent of some new uh, hospital laws and insurance regulations, doctors are telling you now, uh, yes, we can give you an appointment in two months. What? I'll be dead in two months, precisely. Then you won't be able to come in, will you? <laughs> we even treat God the same way, unfortunately and sadly. Expecting God to answer our prayers according to our whims immediately. But the old folks have told you that God may not come when you think he ought to come. God may not come when you feel like he ought to come. Uh, but somehow God is always on time. Amen, somebody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we are forced to wait. <laughs> And that is what we see happening in this story. The saints are waiting. And one is dying. And will be dead. Mary and Martha have sent a message to Jesus telling him that their brother, Lazarus, whom Jesus loves, is sick unto death. And I want you to notice with me the people that Jesus liked to hang around, just simple folk. Mary, the Marys and the Marthas of the world. They're not theologians. They're not spiritual giants. Jesus didn't want to be bothered with those folks. He, he, wanted, he wanted to be around some folks who understood that what it's all about is loving God and loving him. And being real. Simple folk. The Bible says the common people heard him gladly. It was the up and out and the up and out of their minds folk. Uh, the intellectual folk. You know, I can't stand being around these people. Uh, the, the, the rich folk. Jesus did not want to be around. He tried to help them, but he didn't want to be around them. Just the simple folk who lived out in the country, down in a little town called Bethany, not in Jerusalem, in the high rises and the fancy houses, but out on the outskirts. And I guarantee you, most pastors, they got some folk like that who they like being around. They're just common folk. They, they, they know where you come from, and, and they remember when you was in a storefront. But they know how to still throw down some collard green with some fat back, and they know how to get down with it, and some real cornbread with some real butter, not no fake butter. I can't believe it's not butter. No. No. <laughs> Mom and them don't use it. I can't because they can't believe it either. No, no, they hook you right on up with some real soul food. Mm -mm. Won't be no hummus on that table. No, no, no. Hummus or whatever you call it. I'm reminded of a heavy set preacher friend. We were at a special class and bless his heart. He's just a common brother. It's a down home brother. If they put out ice cream, he went and got it. They put out some, uh, some uh, pizza or whatever, he went and got that. One day, 
trying to encourage us to be healthy. They put out some hummus and some carrots. And one of the other priests said, Brother, that's good for you. And I, I, I piped in, which I don't care too much for that kind of food, not at that time of the day, but anyway. But I, uh, I, I have learned to love, love hummus as well at certain times. And I said, yeah, brother, you know, uh, I didn't know what it was a few years ago, but, man, it's good. And it's uh, good for you. And then other priests, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's good for you. Hummus and carrots and celery, man, that's wonderful. And he said, go, you want to go get something? No, I'm not going to get any of that mess. <laughs> he was a down-home brother. He was from the country. He can care less about some hummus and some carrots. That's probably how Lazarus and Mary and Martha were, and Jesus loved being around them. Jesus could kick it with them. I could see Jesus leaning back at the table, just chatting with him, talking with him. Nobody's challenging him about this, asking him crazy questions, off-the-wall questions, trying to trip him up. Can you see those religious folk sitting over there with that little duping the light grin on their face, can't, can't, can't even contain themselves. Jesus, what about this? Anyway, no doubt. They want Jesus to come quickly, that is Mary and Martha, or to speak the word of healing instantaneously, immediately right where he was. We might think that since Jesus loved this man so much, he would rush to do either of those things. But he chooses not to do that for the glory of God. The Bible says when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now in this passage, this is the passage that all of you learned. If you went to Sunday school in the black church, you had to learn it because you had to have a quarter verse in Sunday school every Sunday morning. And most of, you, most of us did not read it. We didn't read the lesson. We didn't read the verses. We didn't memorize the verses. And so we had to go, go to the, that, that, that uh, that ace in the hole, if you, if you will. We had to go to that verse that, just two words. We all knew that one. Sometimes the grown folk had to go to it because they didn't know any verses either. Jesus wept. Everybody knows that verse in the, in the black church. All right, quote, quote a verse for us now. Jesus wept. I got you. I got you. And then we ran back, we said something, we ain't said nothing. Jesus wept. And some of you are wondering why Jesus wept. We'll talk about it more later. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus wept not because he loved Lazarus so much, and he did, and that's part of it, I'm sure. But I believe Jesus wept because he was saying to himself, this is just not how it's supposed to be. If Adam and Eve had done what they were supposed to do, we, we would not have had to suffer all of this death. And so be that as it may, ladies and gentlemen, God's answer in this situation was not yes or no or even maybe. And why did, uh, and, or, or maybe, in fact it was wait. It was not yes or no or even maybe, it was wait. How many times a parent has to try to help an eager teenager to wait? How many times a counselor has to help somebody who wants to jump the gun 
We have to tell them to wait. It seems like, ladies and gentlemen, that few people get the wisdom that they need to get from God to wait. A whole lot of life is made up of waiting. You must wait on God. And so why did Jesus wait? The reason why, beloved, is because God was working out a much bigger plan than either Mary, Martha, or Lazarus could perceive, could perceive. And beloved, it is a sad thing that how so many Christians have jumped the gun, jumped out there and did things they should not have done. They were counseled not to do it. They were advised not to do it by their pastor by the counselors in the church, by the leaders and the deacons in the church, and they jumped out there and did it anyway and made a mess of things because they refused to wait. They weren't ready. And yet they did not wait, and what a mess they made of their lives. So many thousands have run amok as so-called Christians because they refused to wait on God. Amen or oh me. Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. It sounds like Jesus is saying that Lazarus will not die, but we know that that is not the case. For Lazarus will indeed die, but Jesus is looking beyond death. For Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the walking resurrection and life. And Jesus can do something that nobody else was able to do. He knew that he would raise Lazarus from the dead. That is why he said it is not unto death. That is, this sickness will not ultimately and permanently end in death. Something's going to happen. The great Charles Spurgeon said we should have said that the sickness was unto death. But ultimately to the glory of God. But he who sees the end from the beginning speaks with a grandeur of style which could not be imitated by us. So the Lord speaks of things not as they seem to be, nor even as they are in the present moment, but as they shall be in the long run. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's why you need to wait on God. Right now, some of you are in a holding pattern right now as I speak. You don't know what's going on. You're biting at the bit. You're huffing and puffing. You're ready to run off the launch pad and fall right into the sea because you refuse to wait on God. And only people who have wisdom wait on God. Fools rush in. Foolish people rush in and they get burnt. You mark my words on that. If you don't have that ability from God to see the end from the beginning, if you have not received that ability from God where you can see your life right in front of you and you can see right where you are and how that this right here may be a little dip and you're going to be there a while, uh, I, I would encourage you to pray and ask God to give you some wisdom some knowledge, some understanding, to be patient and to wait on God and to give you the peace and the contentment 
to do that. Amen, somebody. I can't, I can't explain that to you. I can't give it to you. There's not a book on earth that you can read to have this. You must get this from God. Amen, somebody. So what will Lazarus' sickness result in in the long run? It will end in God being glorified and the Son of God being glorified and lifted up and seen as the Son of God. We must remember, beloved, that in the previous chapter, Jesus had just been dealing with people who doubted his power over life. <clears throat> he had told them, I have power to lay down my life and take it up again. He was trying to tell them. They did not want to believe him. They did not want to hear him. So surely if he could raise himself from the dead, he could raise someone else from the dead. That's why he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Don't worry about it. In a way, Jesus had decided to give them a demonstration of what he could do. And that's why I'm changing the title of this message to Jesus Raises His Friend Lazarus from the Dead. Think about that. He loved his friend so much. <laughs> he missed his friend so much. He missed, he missed kicking it with his friend. He missed his ace boon coon. He missed his road dog. He missed his countryfied trio at dinner time, eating fried chicken and talking and laughing and not being constantly uh, questioned with trick questions. They loved him for who he was. And he loved them in a real human sense. And you must understand that. But there was a difference. Amen, somebody. The difference is here. This was a friend who had the power to bring his friend back from the grave. Amen, somebody. Amen. When we lose somebody, when we lose our Lazaruses of life, our ace boon coons, our friends, and some, and some friends stick closer to you than a brother. Amen, somebody. Amen. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There are going to be people that, that I will miss more than I miss my own family members. They are closer to me than my own family. They've done more for me than my own family. But when we go to their funeral and we stand over that casket and when, when we see that thing that nobody gets over when the casket with your friend's body is going down into the ground, into the night of the ground forever until he's resurrected. That's a horrible scene. Nobody gets over that. When Jesus arrived to Martha's and Mary's house, he was able to miss, or rather he was able to raise from the dead the friend that he loved and missed. Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. It was to be another irrefutable proof that he is the Son of God, another reason for them to believe on him. Make no mistake about it, Lazarus' sickness and death was a bad situation. One of the sisters cried out and said, well, he's dead and he stinks now. 
You didn't. You took your time coming. Basically, what they're saying. But this did not mean that Jesus had turned his back on his friends by allowing them to suffer through this pain. In fact, the gospel writer saw fit to reemphasize in verse five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. Jesus, being God, could see the end from the beginning. He knew the kind of power raising a man from the dead would represent to the minds of his audience. Lazarus' sickness and death served God's purpose for God's glory and for the glorification of Jesus Christ. This is important to remember when we face what appear to be terminal situations in our lives. Cancer. Other illnesses. Death itself. Yes, my dear friend. My dear parents, you're not going to be the only one who loses a daughter or son. They may die before you. Yes, my dear friend, you're not the only one who will lose a sibling or lose a mother or lose a father or lose an ace boon coon friend. It will happen to you. What I do around here and what I encourage other people to do, ask God to prepare you for death because it is coming. Prepare, uh, prepare for it. Deathbeds are coming. One day you will wake up and your spouse will be dead. Hopefully you did not kill them. May God help your soul if you did. One day you will wake up and, and, and a mother will be dead, a father will be dead, a sister or a brother will be dead. It will happen to you just like it happens to so many and some tragically. in terrible ways. I'm reminded of the father who just today was, uh, yesterday was in a court and the man who robbed him of his daughter, stole his daughter, kidnapped his daughter, raped her brutally and folded her up like she was trash and put her in a trash bag. Here's the sad part, three years ago this satanic joker was over there smirking with a duping delight grin on his face. And that's what triggered this father, who has to be almost 60 years old, heavy set fella. He was, he was rolling like a big old football player in the NFL. He jumped over that banister, and he had his hands in a position to choke the life out of that devil. And I wish he had gotten him. Lord, forgive me. Somehow they, they, they kept him back from killing them, and I, I hope they don't charge him either for, for nothing. There's not a father in America who would not have done the same with that, that devil with that smirk on his face. Deathbeds are coming. Divorce is coming, unfortunately and sadly. Depression, failures of many kinds. Ladies and gentlemen, we may wonder why God is allowing us to suffer instead of delivering us from our troubles and God help the prosperity crowd. How's it working for you? Prosperity gospel people. Your life is in shambles. Your life is a mess. And you're living a fake and phony life and you know it because you, you have troubles and problems and issues and you're doing everything you can behind your little prosperity gospel facade to keep people from knowing what kind of hell you're going through. You hypocrite, you phony, and you fake. You need to drop all of that. 
And by the way, I said it before, and I'll say it again. Buying a house on credit and going into big time debt, trying to keep up with the Joneses and the Smiths and the pastor and his wife, and uh, buying a big fine car on credit is not prosperity. That's called debt. Just wanted to tell you that that's free. You don't have to pay me for that. You say, I'll never listen to you again. That's fine. It's okay. I got you today. We must determine to keep in mind, beloved, that God sees the outcomes of such situations that we cannot imagine. That's why you need to wait on God. You must trust in God. There are things that will happen in your life that you can't do anything. God has fixed it so that you can't do anything but trust in him and wait on him and say, Lord, is up to you. Lord is in your hands. Amen, somebody. God has a much larger purpose that will bring glory to him when all is said and done. As the song says, he makes beautiful things out of the dust. God wants to make something beautiful out of the dust of your life, dear friend. Your past, your present, your personality, your makeup, your goals, and yes, even your suffering and your pain. God wants to use the dust in your life and make it to be a blessing to many others. The pain in your life and make it to be a blessing to many others. I assure you of this. I guarantee you, the people who are helping the most people today have been through hell and back. See, God has a purpose for all of it. Amen, somebody. Amen. And finding out that purpose begins with a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Just like Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, it must begin with Jesus. Dear friend, will you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today and become his friend today like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? If so, here is how. First, dear friend, acknowledge that you are a sinner. This is one of the reasons why uh, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They understood that they were sinners. They understood that they were not all that in the bag of chips. They were humble. And they knew they were sinners and they knew that they needed a savior. And once that relationship is worked out, once that situation is worked out, and you're not constantly trying to query Jesus and trip him up, and you just trust him as your savior, and you love and experience his grace, then you'll have a good relationship with Jesus. So acknowledge that you are a sinner. Admit that you have done wrong in your life and you need a savior. For the Bible tells us that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then realize that if you die without Jesus Christ, that you're going to an awful place called hell. But Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again so that you uh, do not have to go to hell. You can just believe on him and go to heaven with him like Lazarus, like Martha, and just like uh, Mary. And if they can be saved, you can be saved. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou and you shall be saved. Jesus Christ himself said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How about it, dear friend? God wants to make something out of the dust of your life. And he can do it and he will. He'll, he'll give you a significant life. <laughs> he'll give you a life uh, of great value and of great importance. He's the one that makes that possible. 
Are you willing to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again? Pray with me right now as you do that. Phrase by phrase, I will lead you in prayer called the sinner's prayer, asking God to save you through Jesus Christ. Holy Father God, I pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I realize that I am a sinner. I acknowledge that I have done wrong and that I don't deserve heaven, I deserve hell. For Jesus Christ's sake, please have mercy and grace upon me and forgive me of all of my sins as I now believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose again. I believe that he came as the Lamb of God to take away, to shed his blood and to take away all of our sins once and for all. I believe in him. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul and change my life. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past and to follow you in a new life forever. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake, amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you believed in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again, allow me to say congratulations on trusting Christ as your Savior, for you have done the most important thing in life, and that is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. For more information to help you grow in uh, the newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospelightsociety.com and read my pamphlet, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture.